Hi, I'm Dr. Ian Billick, Executive Director of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, and I've put together this talk as part of Rumble's Remotely Curious About Science series. And this talk is meant to introduce you to Rumble and put the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab within the context of some history, um, history of the Gunnison Basin, as well as history of science. Um, we're going to take about 65 minutes, but we're going to cover a little over 600 years of science and uh, the emergence of ecology of a discipline and how the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab fits into that. So welcome, and I look forward to uh, taking this journey with you. One of the trivia questions I like to ask when scientists or students come to Rumble is when they think the first science paper was first published based upon field work in the East River Basin where Rumble is located. Rumble was founded in 1928, so a lot of times the answers date back to 1928 or a little bit later. Occasionally people suspecting me of a trick question will throw out something from the late 1800s. The first science paper based upon field work in the vicinity of Gothic, Colorado actually dates to 1880. Um, and what we're talking about are scientific journals where scientists publish their results. Um, they're peer reviewed, other scientists review them. There was actually a science team that came through the Gunnison Basin in 1873. And like most scientists, it took them a while to get their research out and they didn't get it published to 1880. So science has been happening in the Gunnison Basin almost for as long as um, Europeans have been coming um, and definitely before the mining boom hit. This is a hand drawing of Tiakali Mountain. It's a very distinctive peak um, that you see just east of Gunnison um, beyond Mount Crestpeed Mountain where the ski resort is. And this hand drawing was part of that publication in the American Naturalist in 1880. It was done in the publication as well as the hand drawing um, were done by Ferdinand Hayden, who was a surveyor that came through the Gunnison Basin um, and he was writing up his results and he included this as part of the scientific publication. Um, I've seen this um, as recently as several years ago. There was another journal that was publishing a paper on mountains and biodiversity and they pulled this hand drawing out and included it. So this image actually shows up in a number of different places um, it's beautiful, it's a striking mountain, um, and it goes back to that original publication in 1880. Ferdinand Hayden was one of four great surveyors of the Western United States that went out to kind of document what it was that the United States had. Um, starting in the late 1860s after the Civil War, the US Congress started appropriating money for geologic surveys. Um, the uh, four great surveyors kind of going clockwise from the top left were George Wheeler and then Ferdinand Hayden on your right and then down below him John Wesley Powell who's known for his um, uh, boating down the Grand Canyon and then Clarence King. Um, these surveys were part of larger efforts to just fill in all of the blank spaces in the world. So you can imagine um, that even in the 1860s, 1870s, a lot of the United States was not discovered, mapped, and documented. Um, this is after the Transcontinental Railroad had been installed, so you could take a train from the East Coast to the West Coast, but there were still large parts of the country that we didn't really understand what was out there and what we had. So these surveyors were out there documenting, making maps, understanding what we had, and that publication from 1880 is simply a result of the survey that Hayden did when he came through the Gunnison Basin in 1873. Uh, Hayden did a whole series of surveys and he's perhaps best known for being the person to originally document um, Yellowstone and um, all of the natural wonders found there. These surveys were really documenting everything that was out there, though the original emphasis was on geology. Um, when you look at this slide, one of the things you'll note is that they have some really nice geologic sections of the East River. Um, you can see the team sort of set up that would work. Um, and then there's a, a hand drawing of Gothic Mountain. Um, presumably Gothic Mountain was named by the Hayden Survey and it got its name because the mountain reminded them of the buttresses 
um, from Gothic architecture back in Europe. Um, so they came through and, and you can see some beautiful plates and hand drawings and mountains and sort of geology sections of the area. Um, if you find one of the old books where they documented everything that they found. These were geologic surveys, so perhaps it's not surprising that after the surveys, um, the miners started flooding in. And some of it wasn't just the survey, but also the fact that there were a number of innovations about how to process ore. Um, a lot of ore is not something that you just pick up. You know, sometimes you can find just a hunk of gold lying in a stream, but a lot of metals have to be extracted from the ore. So there were some innovations, technological innovations on how to extract silver, and that drove the silver boom in Gothic. Um, so these show some photographs back in the mining days, um, and that mining boom really started in 1879. Um, you can see all of the buildings sort of lining up the main road down Gothic. And on the left, as you look at this, you can see the Gothic town site facing Gothic Mountain. And there's a big hotel there. Um, and that became the uh, Grant Hotel. Ulysses S. Grant, former president, visited Gothic. And after he spent a little bit of time in that hotel, they named it after him. And then one of the other buildings, if you take a close look, you can see on the slide on the left, is Swallow's Nest, which dates to 1879 and was a attorney's building. And you'll still see that building looking largely the same if you drive through Gothic today. Gothic boomed uh, with the silver, silver mining. Um, probably the most productive mine was the Sylvanite Mine, which is located up by Copper Lake. If you follow Copper Creek to the east from Gothic and you climb up just below the pass there, you get to Copper Lake and the Sylvanite mine was very active and productive into the early 1900s. Um, one of the interesting facts that I learned about the mining was that for a number of years, the main way in and out of Aspen was actually over the pass above Copper Lake on the road down um, paralleling Copper Creek and into Gothic. Um, so at some point in the 1880s, they got a railroad to go in and out of Aspen, but for a period of time, the main way they moved materials in and out of Aspen was actually through the town of Gothic and they built a toll road. Um, so when you walk along that, it's pretty wide and it's pretty flat. And there were mule teams that were going all winter long, bringing materials in and out. Um, Silver, the value of silver crashed in the 1890s. So there was sort of the national silver crash. And when that happened, the value of silver dropped dramatically. Um, Gothic is a pretty remote location. We're up over 9,000 uh, feet in elevation. We get 450 inches of snow in a typical year. So it's not an easy place to be, not an easy place to get ore and get it out. So the transportation costs are quite high. So that silver crash, hit Gothic really hard. And except for the continued operation of the Sylvanite mine that went on another 10 years or so, pretty much the old area bottomed out. And so all of those buildings that had been built um, quickly started to fall into disrepair. Um, given how much snow we have and how brutal the winter environment is at 9,000 feet in elevation, um, buildings just don't last. Um, so this is a photograph not long after the collapse has started and you can see that the town site is already emptying out. One of the buildings on the right is the Gothic Town Hall. It was actually a saloon. Um, the founder of RMBL, John Johnson, was pretty conservative and he did not like to have a saloon associated with the biology laboratory. So, um, so they Rumble developed the tradition of referring to that as a town hall. That building's still there and you can see that if you come into the town site. And then if you squint in the middle, you can actually see the swallow's nest, um, which I mentioned on an earlier slide, which is still there. And it's kind of an iconic structure um, that you'll see in all of the old photographs. So I kind of start halfway through Gothic's history with the founding of Gothic as a mining town. And you know, really what I start with is when Ferdinand Hayden comes through, with one of the big survey teams in 1873. But what those survey teams were doing was something that started much earlier. And, and one of the questions I like to throw out to the students is, what started the age of exploration 
and discovery. Um, I mean, something happened in back in sort of human history that launched exploration and discovery. And what's going on with the Hayden survey is just sort of the natural culmination of, uh, of a pattern of exploration to discovery that happened in the mid 1400s. So we could probably pin the origins of the age of exploration and discovery on a lot of different trends or a lot of different incidents. Um, but I like to go back following some historians to the fall of Constantinople in 1453. And it may seem kind of strange to pin it on the fall of Constantinople, but um, that was an important event um, that shut down a lot of the spice trade into Europe. Um, spices were something that were economically valuable that were coming in from all over and they were coming overland and when Constantinople fell and was lost to the European empires, um, it completely changed how people looked at landscapes and prompted exploration and discovery. Constantinople had been important to the spice trade and um, the map in sort of the bottom left-hand corner when you're looking at this slide shows the spice trade moving overland through Constantinople. Um, they were coming out of Southeast Asia, um, Spice Island, nutmeg, pepper. Um, there were a lot of valuable spices um, and people were willing to spend a lot of money on them. Now, why are people spending money on spices and why were they so valuable economically? One answer is, is that spices taste good. Um, another answer is that they help preserve food. Um, so um, they're antibiotics. They're good at killing microbes and bacteria um, and people put them on their food and it's a form of self-medication. Um, self-medication being the use of chemicals um, to kind of keep us healthy. And one way that we keep ourselves healthy is we avoid eating food that's loaded up with a lot of nasty, nasty chemicals. Before I spend too much time on the age of exploration and discovery, though, I'm gonna do a little bit of a diversion to talk about plant secondary compounds and antibiotics and spices. Um, so I talked about humans using spices to self-medicate, and a lot of people would say, well, they didn't really know they were medicating themselves. They just were using the spices because they taste good. Well, I think it's sort of fun to talk about self-medication because it turns out that humans aren't the only animals that self-medicate. Um, the photograph on this slide in the upper left shows a bee visiting an aster plant and some scientists that work at Rumble, including Dr. Rebecca Irwin, have shown that bees actually self-medicate. So if they get loaded with parasites, they will spend more time foraging on some of these showy yellow aster plants, which are loaded up with a lot of chemicals. And it turns out that those chemicals will help clear the bees of parasites. Um, a lot of plants are loaded up with chemicals and we don't always know what it is that those chemicals are doing. And often we call those plant secondary compounds. Um, these are chemicals that are not serving some obvious physiological function like grabbing energy from the sun or photosynthesis. Um, but the realization has been that often plants have a lot of chemicals so that they are not eaten. So they're deterring herbivory. Um, well, it turns out that the chemicals that plants use to keep us from eating them are also useful for the things that eat them to deter parasites on them. Um, and so in many instances, um, animals, insects that figure out how to eat those plants or consume those chemicals, and the trick is always getting the right dosage, are able to protect themselves and self-medicate. And then one of my favorite examples has to do with cows in Larkspur. Um, so in the Gunnison Basin, typically the ranchers will not bring cows up to graze to higher elevations until the tiny Larkspur are done flowering and the larkspur loaded up with chemicals that are toxic. In small amounts, in the right dosages, the um, uh, cows will consume them and it helps protect them from feeling cold. So they'll get some kind of little buzz. So if a cold front is coming in, they'll eat just a little bit of that and they won't feel the cold the same amount. Um, but if they eat too much of it, or if they eat 
aren't certain and they eat it by accident, they can overdose. So humans are not the only animals that use plant secondary compounds to self-medicate or to manage their physiological state. It turns out to be something that's relatively common. And this desire for spices, either because of taste or um, preserving foods or keeping ourselves healthy, um, really initiated that age of exploration and discovery. Because once the spice route, overland spice route was shut down with the fall of Constantinople, there was huge economic pressure for people to figure out another path um, by sea to get those spices. With the fall of Constantinople, explorers and discoverers started journey, journeying down the west coast of Africa. And the technology for the ships wasn't sufficient originally for them to do long journeys. They struggled if they got too far away from, um, from the mainland. They didn't know how to navigate, keep track of where they were. But um, again, huge economic incentive because if they could bring spices back, they were gonna make a lot of money. So people kept trying and they kept pushing further and further down the west coast of Africa until they were able to get around uh, the uh, Cape. Um, and as technology improved, they got better and better and able to journey further. Um, one of the metaphors I like is this term, here there be dragons. And in some of the old, old maps, when they were figuring out exploration and discovery, when there was some part of the world and they just didn't know what was there, they would draw a dragon and say, here there be dragons. Um, and so I like to think of the age of exploration and discovery as being the process of filling in all of those empty spaces on the maps as the explorers are out there charting, navigating new places. And when we talk about the Hayden survey coming to the Gunnison Basin in the 1870s, we're just talking about one of those last great expeditions that's filling in the holes on the map. And what they're doing is replacing dragons with scientific knowledge, um, geology, biology, about what's going on in those locations. Um, so that whole process leading to the founding of Gothic as a mining town starts, in my opinion, with the fall of Constantinople and sort of a push to uh, get rid of all of the dragons of the world and fill in all of those empty spaces. Many would argue that the rise of the British Empire and science kind of go hand to hand and that the British Navy is a critical part of that. So not only did the British Navy um, allow the British Empire to get established, but the British Navy helped um, sort of generate the technological innovations that enabled exploration and discovery. Um, as sort of a symbol of how close the British Navy and science were intertwined, um, the Royal Society, which is the longest standing scientific society, and the formal British Royal Navy were both founded in the same year in 1660. And just to kind of highlight the relationship between the British Navy and technological innovation and science, I thought it would be fun to talk about one of the critical innovations, which was longitude. Um, when the explorers were out there, one of the critical things that they needed was to be able to track where they were. Um, they didn't want to run into shoals in the middle of the night or sort of get lost, go off the edge of the world. So they needed to get location. And location on a globe is defined by latitude and longitude. Latitude turned out to be a fairly simple problem, but longitude can be pretty complex. And there are sort of two different main pathways to solving it. One is to use astronomy, and the other is to use a clock. If you know your time and it's very accurate, you can calculate your longitude. If you do a really good job of celestial navigation, you can also navigate um, and know your exact location and longitude. So um, the British Empire launched a competition um, and offered a lot of money to whoever could uh, solve the longitude problem. And then I like to point out um, that the person who ended up arbitrating and deciding between the clockmakers and the astronomers was a botanist. So Joseph Banks, who was president of the Royal Society um, and based his science career on botany, was actually the person who had to decide who won the prize. Another technological innovation that turned out to be really important for discovery was the lime. And obviously they didn't invent the lime, but rather they figured out how to use it. Um, one of the challenges for these long voyages 
was that the sailors weren't necessarily getting balanced diets. And many of them developed scurvy, which turned out to be a vitamin deficiency. And um, James Cook, who is one of the main navigators from the 1700s, um, and Joseph Banks, um, who was the arbiter on the longitude debate, um, and, and Joseph Banks joined James Cook on his first expedition. James Cook figured out that if he kept limes um, and provided that as part of the diet, they could avoid problems with scurvy. And that enabled some really long journeys um, that otherwise would have been impossible without killing off all of the sailors. One of the results of these expeditions, um, curiously, were called cabinets of curiosities. And cabinets of curiosities were something that wealthy people kept. And when the explorers and discoverers would come back from their journeys, they would often find amazing skeletons or they would have botanical specimens or pinned insects. And wealthy people would acquire those and put them in their cabinets of curiosity. Um, some of this was not just curiosity, some of it was uh, economically important. So quinine, which is an important um, medical tool in the fight against malaria, was discovered in the South American highlands in a plant, again, a plant secondary compound that helps protect us. Um, and so these collections, these natural history collections that people were bringing back um, were both a way to kind of just be curious about the world that was being discovered, but in many instances led to economic discoveries or health discoveries that were very important. Interestingly, these natural history collections form the basis of the Natural History Museum in London or Kew Gardens, where a lot of the botanical specimens went. Um, this tradition of museums, in many ways, dates back to these cabinets of curiosity. In some ways, we could say that field science and field biology really started with these explorer and discoverers that were bringing items back. Um, and handing them off to people who put them in their cabinets of curiosities. Um, if we jump forward to the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, RMBL is known for ecology, um, which is the study of how organisms interact with their environment. Um, and, and these original field scientists weren't necessarily doing ecology because all they were doing was collecting and documenting the world's diversity. Um, the maybe ecology starts to emerge in the early 1800s with one of the great early explorers, Alexander von Humboldt. Um, you may know the name Humboldt. We have Humboldt County, we have Humboldt Park, we have lots of things named after Humboldt in the United States. And he was a well-known figure in the early 1800s out of Germany and Europe who did a lot of exploring and collecting. What I'm and I've shown a photograph, or not a photograph, a painting of him sitting on your left when you look at the slide. Um, but then there's a drawing um, from one of his works. Um, and, and this shows one of the big volcanoes in Ecuador. And, and we see kind of some of the earliest thinking um, leading to ecology in Humboldt's work because he writes about different plant zones and how the environment affects what kind of plants are found at different elevations. And I know it's too small to see, but all of those little words that you can't see on the slide represent plants in different ecozones there on the volcano. And so it's some of the original thinking um, that, that leads eventually to the field of ecology. Probably some more well-known scientists um, that were involved in the emergence of uh, ecology as a scientific discipline are Charles Darwin and then someone who's less well known, Alfred Wallace. Both scientists were kind of co-discoverers of the theory of evolution. And, and Charles Darwin is known for the voyage that he took. Um, he served on the ship and he was a naturalist and a lot of his focus was on collecting material. So he collected birds, he collected plants, he was really documenting everything that he could find on this voyage. But maybe what made Darwin unique was he started thinking about not just documenting and making list of the world's diversity, but understanding and explaining it and understanding how it came to be. So with the finches on the Galapagos Islands, understanding why they're very similar looking birds, but different species on different islands. 
Alfred Wallace was another scientist who independently discovered evolution, and he was also a collector. He was doing a lot of work out in the Southeast Pacific um, on the islands, and the way that he funded his trips was he would collect material to give to wealthy collectors, going back to the cabinets of curiosity. And, and he collected a lot of butterflies and um, showing the kind of butterfly and moth diversity um, that he would collect and then he'd bring back and sell those to the collectors and help fund his exploration and discovery. The theories, the theory of evolution that they both developed because it tried to explain the world's diversity and then to do that needed to explain and understand the relationship between organisms like butterflies and birds and their environment also really helped set the stage for ecology. So um, they followed after Alexander von Humboldt. We know that Darwin took a copy of Humboldt's writings with him on his voyage, um, but they sort of developed ideas related to ecology um, and took it the next step further. So before the formal emergence of the discipline of ecology, um, field stations and marine labs started to pop up. And it makes sense if we think about the evolution of field science and the original field science is focused on documenting the world's diversity, but then people wanna start expanding the range of questions that they're asking and they might need to study living organisms. Anton Dorn helped develop a field station in Trieste, Italy, and there was a lot of cell biology that was being done with sea organisms. The scientists were really taking advantage of microscopes. Microscopes had been around for a long time, but the, in the 1800s, they had figured out how to really use them to drive forward cell biology and other scientific disciplines. Because they were working with sea organisms and there was not refrigeration, they needed places where uh, right after they collected the material in the ocean, they could get it right under the microscope. Um, and so that led to the emergence of, of what's considered kind of the first um, biological field station. And it was really serving marine research um, with a focus on kind of wet biology and not field biology. Uh, but Anton Dorn in 1874, it's when we kind of see the first thing that looks like a field station emerge internationally. Following the establishment of the um, zoology station in Italy, we see the emergence of field stations or things that look like field stations in the United States towards the very end of the 1800s. Um, a couple of the classic facilities are the Chesapeake Zoological Laboratory um, that started operating in 1878. This actually moved around a little bit, so there wasn't a fixed location. It, kind of like the Trieste facility, they're very focused on marine and doing work in the ocean. Um, there was also the Forbes facility in Illinois in 1894. Um, what's interesting, the scientist Forbes, who got the field station going, would use the term ecology, spelled a little bit differently, um, but the, the term in the approach to science that we know of as ecology today, um, you can directly trace to Forbes and his field station there in Illinois, and they're working on lakes. And then the Flathead Biological Station with the University of Montana also emerged right next to a lake. You can see it on your far right, some of the students out in 1899. So the United States, we see the emergence of facilities to support scientists working in the field. Again, these are all sort of wet biologists. So they're people that are working with, with water samples. Around the same time, so again, the very end of the late 1800s and the early 1900s, we see uh, true field stations emerging. And what this is, is a list of different field stations that were popping up in the Western United States. It includes Flathead Lake in Montana in 1899, another place, um, the New Mexico Biological Station. Um, probably the one that gets credit for being a true field station is often the Desert Botanical Lab, um, organized through the Carnegie Institution right outside Tucson, Arizona. Um, you might notice that there's the Rocky Mountain Biological Station um, that was started in 1922 in Gunnison County. 
and then in 1928, RMBL, sort of the focus of this talk tonight. Um, so um, we see field stations just popping up everywhere all about the same time, and in, they're coincident with the emergence of ecology as a scientific discipline. So ecology emerges, 1915, uh, professional society is the Ecological Society of America. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we define ecology as the study of organisms and how they interact with the environment. Um, after the founding of the Ecological Society of America, we see the emergence of a, of a journal, scientific journal, that's really dedicated to ecological research. And it kind of emerged from a journal that was focused on botanical research. Um, and so even though this shows volume three, um, it's actually the first volume of ecology um, the previous volumes had different titles that didn't have ecology in the title. So 1922 is when we see ecology. 1915 is when the professional society uh, first emerges following on Forbes' use of the term. And then 1922, we see a full-on journal using ecology as the name. So now we're ready to come full circle and come back to the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. So we, we started with the Hayden survey in Gothic and showing up in 1873 and doing some of the first field research. And we talked about the founding of Gothic as a mining town in 1879, and then that collapsed in the 1890s. And then um, because we're just wandering and exploring, we jumped all the way back to the fall of Constantinople and talked about how explorers and discoverers started to fill in the map. And then we traced the arch of ecology, the arc of ecology, um, through Alexander von Humboldt and through Darwin and Wallace, some of those ideas and for using the term ecology and the emergence of field stations in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So this brings us to John Johnson, 1909. In 1909, um, Western, which is the local college and university, um, established a normal school, which is a school that trains teachers, and John Johnson ended up teaching there. He married a local woman from Gunnison, um, but then decided to go off to University of California, Berkeley and get his PhD in parasitology. Um, in about 10 years later, in 1919, Western decided to convert from a normal school training teachers to a regional four-year college. And it was very difficult to find PhD professors to move to remote rural areas um, they knew that John Johnson had family here and he had come back to visit. So they asked him if he would be willing to start the science department at Western. He accepted the position and started a biology department. And then as part of that, he established the Rocky Mountain Biological Station, which was on that list just north of Gunnison in Almont. And that was a field station operated through Western State. Um, and he op they operated that for about six or seven years, but then they ran into political problems um, that led to John Johnson leaving Western and then setting up an independent field station, the Rocky Mountain Biological Laboratory. This is an odd slide to have in a history of science talk, but the issues that led to John Johnson leaving Western and the establishment of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab had to do with the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Klux Klan was very active in Gunnison and Colorado and a lot of the United States in the 1920s. And the first president of Western was not active with the Klan. They got him fired. And John Johnson was the Dean of Science and part of the management team. So they got him fired too. He sued the school for an illegal firing and Western hired him back. He quit and took a job with a college, Edinburgh, back in Pennsylvania. And he decided that even though he was leaving Gunnison and moving away, that he still wanted to have a field station here in Gunnison County, um, maybe in part, so it would be a way to come back and visit his wife's family. And uh, when he decided he wanted to do that, he was very familiar with the town side of Gothic. He talks about driving into Gothic in 1919 just being amazed by the beautiful wildflowers and seeing all the old abandoned buildings. And so he had this seed of thought that if he ever needed facilities to start a field station, that might be the place to do it. So after he abandoned the Rocky Mountain Biological Station, 
um, which was owned and operated by Western, he moved into Gothic. So Gothic in 1928 had largely emptied out. Um, the miners had been gone at this point for almost 40 years. So if, if you remember the silver, uh, cost of silver kind of crashed in the 1890s, the place emptied out. Um, there are very few buildings left. You can see in the slide on your left, the Gothic Town Hall, the building that's still there. And in the forefront with a tree in front of it, you can see the swallow's nest. Um, so John Johnson moved into the town site and decided to take over some of those buildings and he worked with Garwood Judd. So Garwood Sh Judd is shown in both of these photos, um, walking with his dog there in the bottom photo. And Garlet, Gar um, sorry, Garwood had shown up in Gothic in the early 1880s and had never really left. He would spend uh, winters down in Gunnison, but he would spend his summers up in Gothic. Um, so when John Johnson needed facilities, Garwood helped arrange for him to rent buildings or buy property. Turned out that Garwood didn't actually own most of those buildings. And so Rumble and John Johnson ended up paying for many of them twice. Um, but they still talk about Garwood Judd fairly fondly. And the Judd Falls um, are located just above Gothic and there's a bench up there dedicated to Garwood as the man who stayed. Here is a little bit of what the Gothic town site looked like when John Johnson was founding it. And on the right, um, it shows the old Grant Hotel. If you remember, there was a big building in Gothic in the 1880s that stood out, um, named after Grant from his visit to Gothic. Um, it had largely fallen to pieces and the biologists moved in and put their name on it and used it as laboratory and housing. And then they also started using a bunch of the older buildings. Here's another one of the old buildings. So this is Garwood Judd, and I believe he's with Joe Buzzard. Great name, right? Um, and they're standing in front of what we call the Mammal Lab. The Mammal Lab was actually an assay building that was built by the Desette Company in 1914 when they tried to revive mining. And the Desette Company very generously allowed Rumble to use that building until after World War II. And after World War II, they ended up donating it to Rumble. But it was a core facility um, from the very early days um, where they taught classes. In this photo, I just sort of love it. It captures a lot of interesting things. You can see the town hall there on the right. And this photo dates to 1928. And it was a family out of Illinois visiting um, just to learn a little bit more about the field station and the research that was going on. You can see the swallow's nest there in the background um, up on the hill on the left side. And here's a photo of all of the scientists and students and families that were there in Gothic in 1928. John Johnson is in the back on the left um, in sort of the back row. And uh, you can see his kids, including Clea and Chris, um, and the twins um, sitting there with some of the other kids in the front row. Um, Dr. Bean is on your left. He's a scientist from Germany that came over as part of the first year. Um, so they were able to attract a number of scientists um, to get the biological lab going pretty quickly. A lot of the original focus at Rumble in the late 1920s and 1930s was around education and students. Um, there wasn't what we think of the professional research class focused on getting grants and writing scientific publications. You can see Dr. Bob Enders um, lecturing on the porch of Mammal Lab, and then a couple students working inside the Mammal Lab. Um, they've got, looks like, collecting jars and are doing some drawings and working with some of the old books. And so this just gives you a sense of what Rumble was like in the 1930s. If we step away from Gothic for just a second in the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab and look again at the big picture, um, we talked about exploration and discovery, um, and that was current through the 1880s. But um, by the 1900s, a lot of the world had been discovered. So except for a few places like Papua New Guinea, um, where they're still running expeditions, a lot of the discovery process turned inward, focused on technology. And there was a big change in how research happened in the United States following World War II. So FDR, the president, one of the things that he um, 
sort of came to to uh, in his thinking was that he felt that that technology and science was critical to the United States helping to win World War II. So radar, the nuclear bomb, submarines, um, a lot of things. And, and he was very interested in using technology and science to win the peace. I think those were his words. So given how important science was to winning the war, he wanted to capture the um, value of that science um, and continue to take advantage of it after the war was done. So he commissioned a piece um, by Vanover Bush, who was a dean of science at MIT and a science advisor, who put together a set of recommendations in a publication called Science, the Endless Frontier, who talked about the potential for science um, for the country moving forward and how we might actually implement that. And so with that report coming out of World War II, um, the federal government started investing major dollars in basic and fundamental research. And just as an example of, of what starts to happen after World War II is we see the emergence or the consolidation of a number of federal agencies who have a focus on science. So the National Science Foundation, which is currently one of the major funders of scientists working at Rumble, was founded in 1950. The Department of Energy had organized the Manhattan Project that led to the nuclear bomb. And following that tradition, they ended up focusing and currently focus on research projects that involve mobilizing large number of scientists working collaboratively. The National Institutes of Health emerged in 1944, the Public Health Service Act. Um, they built upon some existing health agencies, but the way we know NIH today which really drives discovery of drugs and uh, medicine and things to improve our lives and our human health, what, how we know that really emerged there right at the end of World War II. World War II was not necessarily great for RMBL per se. Um, and no surprise, there were very few people in Gothic and there were probably a summer or two where there was no one. There's some correspondence where they, John Johnson asked if someone could stop by and just sort of take a look at the facilities. And the reality is, is a lot of the people who are in the next generation of scientists served in World War II. So Chris Johnson, who is John Johnson's son and who served as Rumble's director for approximately 10 years and got a PhD in ornithology. Um, he was in the army and served in the Battle of the Bulge. Um, Ralph Langenheim, another longtime Rumble scientist um, and a geologist. And it was uh, Ralph and his students that discovered the molybdenum deposits here in Crested Butte, which has led to a whole series of other issues. Um, he was in the Navy and he was in the D-Day invasion. Um, another scientist, um, Sid DeBoer, um, he was in the Air Force and he uh, mapped North Africa. I had the privilege of knowing all three of these individuals and hearing a little bit about uh, their, you know, their service, though Chris Johnson um, never really talked about it with me. Um, but Sid would tell me about flying into all of these remote oases in Northern Africa as part of mapping. So a lot of the scientists um, were not coming to Gothic because they were in service. Um, so even though there was a big investment coming out of World War II, John Johnson, the founder of Rumble, was faced with this dilemma of how to get the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab jump-started again. A fun story related to how John Johnson got Rumble jump-started again after World War II um, leads to the discovery of the Nobel Prize four or five years ago. Um, so in the early 1950s, John Johnson, as part of getting Rumble going again, decided that there should be a celebration of Rumble's 25th anniversary. And he started inviting whoever he could think of to come back out just as a way of creating activity um, on vitality. And one of the scientists that he wrote to is shown on your left, and that's Colin Pittendrig. And Colin Pittendrig became known as the father of the biological clock. Um, he was very eclectic. He did a lot of things. He worked with NASA on Mars missions. Um, but he came out to Rumble in the 1950s, and he did an experiment um, that really changed how people thought about the biological clock. Um, and he talks about the facilities when he arrived as being kind of ripe, rough, but the price was right because they weren't charging him anything. And he found an old abandoned outhouse and he got his wife's 
pressure cooker and he found a stream because he liked to fly fish and that was why he was kind of willing to come out. And he studied flies and how fly larvae would develop. And using the outhouse and the pressure cooker and the streams, he manipulated pressure, temperature, light. And he found that the flies were able to keep an internal rhythm, which suggested that there was a biological clock that regulated their lives. And uh, three or four years ago, the Nobel Prize was given to these three scientists that ended up working out a lot of the details of the biological clock. Um, but Pittendrig was known as the father of the biological clock and sort of initiated a lot of that uh, eventual research. And one of his early critical experiments was done in an outhouse in Gothic. And he came to Gothic because he liked to fly fish. And John Johnson was just trying to figure out how to get people to come back out. Colin Pittendrig was not the only scientist that John Johnson was able to recruit. And there were a number of scientists in the late 40s, 1950s, early 1960s that represented the next generation of scientists along with Dr. Pittendrig. Um, uh, Dr. Remington, Charles Remington is shown on your top left holding the butterflies. He was a professor at Yale, um, became known as the father of butterfly biology. Bob and Scotty Willie are shown next to him on the top in the middle, both scientists that worked at Rumble. Uh, Scotty, I think, was the first female scientist to get a PhD from Harvard University in the late 1950s. Ken Armitage, who was at the University of Kansas and helped found the discipline of physiological ecology, started coming out around then. Jean Langenheim, on your bottom left, she did her PhD. She married Ralph Langenheim, so they were an academic couple until they got an academic divorce. He did his PhD on geology, and Jean did her PhD on plant succession, um, working with some of the early ecologists. Um, so she started working out here in the late 40s. Paul Ehrlich, who was a very well-known popular figure in the 1960s and 1970s, started coming out about the same time as Ken Armitage in the early 1960s. Um, in some ways following Charles Remington, Paul Ehrlich's research, his fundamental research was on butterflies. And then in similar fashion, Dr. Ward Watt started about the same time, another amazing butterfly scientist following in the lineage of uh, Charles Remington started coming out about that same time. Long time faculty member at Stanford University be before moving to the University of South Carolina. So Rumble was a great place to come and it's so a great place to come. And the scientists just kept coming back. And what that meant is it has meant that Rumble has become host to one of the world's uh, largest collections of long-term studies. Um, the butterfly work that uh, um, Carol Boggs does dates back to 1986 and some of her long-term tracking. Ward Watt, who's been doing research on butterflies, started as I mentioned in the early 1960s. The Marmot Project goes back to Ken Armitage in the early 1960s. Uh, plant flowering, um, when they flower and all that starts in 1971. Um, so it's a beautiful place and people keep coming back. And so we ended up with one of the largest collections of long-term studies. Not only did Rumble end up with the biggest collection of long-term studies, but we just had wonderful scientists who were well known and continue to be well known in a number of different subdisciplines within ecology. Rumble is probably best known for the research on pollination biology, the study of how insects and animals pollinate plants, as well as plant insect interactions. Um, so, how plants defend themselves from herbivory and how insects eat them. Um, in part, we became so well known to the pollination biologists of the world is because Crested Butte and Gothic are one of the few places in the world where we don't have the introduced honeybee. So people who are interested in understanding natural systems gravitated towards Rumble. Um, and we have had just this amazing collection of world-class pollination biologists. In addition to pollination biology, another sub-discipline um, that Rumble scientists have had a big impact on is ecological physiology. Physiology being the study of how organisms um, kind of maintain their temperature and how their metabolism works and how that's affected by their ecology. Um, this goes back in part to Dr. Ken Armitage, 
who worked with marmots and also was a major figure in ecological physiology. This shows a uh, cover of some marmot research um, related to physiology and marmots, how they're responding to climate change. And then another amazing ecological physiologist was Dr. Bill Calder, who studied hummingbirds and was fascinated by the fact that hummingbirds live so long, even though most small organisms don't live long and long lived organisms tend to be large things like elephants. Um, so he did a lot of really interesting physiological work with hummingbirds at RMBL. Another discipline that's really started to take off at RMBL is ecological genomics. So as the cost of sequencing genes has dropped dramatically, um, it's been a lot easier to relate the genomes of organisms to their environment and how they interact with their environment. I'm showing a picture of a Arabidopsis, which is a plant, actually I should say Bukhara, it's related to Arabidopsis, um, but a little mustard plant that uh, several scientists, Jill Anderson and Tom Mitchell Olds have worked on doing genomics. Uh, Ward Watt, who I mentioned earlier, has done some amazing work with the coleus and yellow butterflies and the genes related to color production and their ability to uh, fly and, and be active at different temperatures. And then Noah Whiteman with his student Nicholas Alexander shown on the right, um, taking advantage of some uh, work on cardamony, a different mustard and the relationships with flies, looking at the genomic architecture of how organisms are interacting. Aquatic biology, um, both in terms of lakes, ponds, as well as streams, has been a very active area of research. Dr. Bobby Pekarski started at Rumble in the early 1970s, and Scott Wissinger, Stan Dotson, um, some amazing research on streams and on ponds, um, and, and they've generated the science um, and written the textbooks, or the textbooks are written about their research um, on how we can use insects as indicators of water quality, um, how we can understand um, sort of the ecological features of the environment that determine the life histories of insects. Um, so aquatic biology is very well known around the world. Not surprising given um, how the emergence of the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab has sort of paralleled the academic discipline of ecology that a number of presidents of the Ecological Society of America have also had long ties with RMBL. A.O. Weiss is shown in the middle, and uh, he was one of the founders of RMBL and one of the early presidents of the Ecological Society of America. Hal Mooney, um, on your top left, was a student at Rumble. Uh, Gene Langenheim, I've already referred to, um, was a president in the 1980s, and then more recently, Dr. David Anyway. Um, so my point here is that Rumble has been really involved with the emergence of ecology um, as a scientific discipline. Um, and not only has there been great uh, research on ecology that's emerged from Rumble, but many of ecology's leaders have also um, been intertwined with RMBL. Okay, so it's been quite a journey. Um, we've talked about the Hayden survey, coming out in the 1870s, and then we jump back to Constantinople and its fall in 1853, uh, 1453, and the emergence of the explorers and discoverers, and then science, and then ecology as a discipline. We talked about the founding of RMBL, kind of coming out of um, problems with the Ku Klux Klan, um, and then the emergence of ecology and a lot of the research that's happened here. So the long-term research, as well as a number of of said disciplines in ecology. So I'm gonna close with just a few words about modern research. And I'm showing a photograph of the Gossip Research Center that was built a little less than 10 years ago um, that's really transformed the kind of work that can be done at Rumble um, and enabled scientists to take advantage of all of the wonderful new emerging technology. I find it difficult to fully articulate just how quickly the technology is emerging and what we can do with it. So from sequencing genomes, um, 20 years ago when I started as director of RMBL, it cost more than a billion dollars to sequence the genome of one person. And now Nicholas Alexander, that graduate student I showed you several slides ago, is sequencing the genome of individual hummingbirds for less than $100. Um, 
the scientists were able to look at protein structure. So that middle slide is a protein and proteins are like tools. So what they do within organisms really depends upon their shape and a mutation changes their shape. Um, so Ward Watt, when he's working on butterflies, can look not only at the genes, but the proteins that those genes are responsible for. Um, and then you can't quite see it, but on the far right is a weather station. Um, sensor technology and our ab ability to measure things has changed dramatically. And then Dr. Diane Campbell is shown with a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, um, which she's using to open up the world of smell um, to better understand what's going on in pollination biology. So our ability to measure things and to see all of the little things from genes to proteins to cells, as well as measure the large, larger world has just changed dramatically in the last five to 10 years. So as Rumpel has thought about going forward, we've really built on this idea that we call the ecology of place. This is an idea um, developed by Mary Price and other scientists, which is that sustained study of a single location enables insights into how the world works that you couldn't get from just studying lots of different locations independently and separately. And that's the fundamental idea is that the world is so complex that unless you have teams of scientists working across generations and collaborating with different tools, you can never put all of those pieces of information together to get a synthetic understanding of how the world works. This idea of the Gunnison Basin and the East River Basin as a model ecosystem really just extends very successful approaches in science um, with something called model organisms. And so here I'm showing in the bottom left, the fungi, and then the Arabidopsis plant, um, and then a fly, a fruit fly. Um, and there on the top left is a phylogeny, which shows different kingdoms of plants and animals, and how in each of these kingdoms and domains, there are organisms that are intensively studied um, and they're called model organisms. And, and they're model organisms because thousands of scientists will work on them and they'll each get their own individual insight and will be more efficient because they can share tools and they'll be able to do more synthetic work because they'll be able to integrate the different research projects. So science and biology, because they're dealing with such complex systems, has taken advantage of this idea of model, uh, model organisms. And what we're doing at Rumble is essentially extending that idea to a full ecosystem. Um, so by sharing tools and being able to put information together and creating synthetic approaches, um, we can get a really deep understanding of how the world works. This understanding of how the world works is not just a matter of exploration and discovery, but it's something that's critically relevant to the quality of your life. Um, and if we think about those original explorers and those cabinets of curiosities, it's true that many of the items that they found were just curious and gave them a lens to see the world. But it's also true that some of those things that the explorers were bringing back were plants that had lots of economic value from coffee to chocolate to quinine. Um, plant secondary chemicals, which we use for medicine. Uh, Rumble scientist, a student of graduate student, uh, Dr. Paul Ehrlich is Dr. Gretchen Daly, who's shown here. And she's known for developing this idea of ecosystem services, which is putting an economic valuation on all of the things that our natural ecosystems do um, that support human life and quality of life and economic systems. Um, and uh, that's ranges from water to invasive species to biogeochemical cycles like nitrogen and carbon um, to infectious disease like Zika or more recently the coronavirus. Um, so this approach to the Gunnison Basin as a model ecosystem, it's not just a matter of curiosity, but it's something that actually potentially has lots of economic value across the world. And just to give you a few examples of how the research at Rumble has affected policy and economics as well as quality of life, I'm just going to throw up a few. Um, some research done by Dr. John Hart and his collaborators up at the Mexican Cut um, led to legislation during the revision of the Clean Air Act in the early 1990s. 
Um, so we can say that the air in the Western United States is cleaner in part because of the science done at RMBL. Food security is another uh, issue that's been informed by research at RMBL. Here I show Dr. David Anyway, who's been working on plant flowering times. And the top two photographs, on the one on your left and then in the middle, show the same meadow on this um, almost the same day of the year. And one meadow is just, and it's the same meadow, but one year it's filled with sunflowers and other years it's not. And, and what David has discovered in his almost 50 years of tracking plant flowering times is that as the uh, summers have gotten a little bit warmer earlier, plants are getting more susceptible to frost. And when they flower early, we get the frost events about the same time, so we lose the flowers. Um, agricultural systems don't have 50 years of data, but many people are experiencing the same thing. And David's research helps interpret and understand what's going on with agricultural systems and how they're responding to slightly warmer temperatures. Water is a critical issue um, in the West. It, it underpins a lot of the economic value and uh, um, sort of a lot of what's happening in the Western United States. It's become a significant area of research by the Department of Energy. Um, on the far right, I'm showing one of the cool tools that they use. So this is the meanders down on the East River. And it's simply a way that um, they visualize um, how things work and how nutrients flow through that system. But this work on water goes back um, a long time, 60 years, and is an example of some of the work that has policy implications. Dr. Theo Colburn um, has popularized the issue of endocrine disruption, small little chemicals that mimic endocrine and disrupt the development of, um, of uh, embryos. And she got her start doing research on water quality here at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. So really to go back to this idea of the Gunnison Basin as a model ecosystem, what we're talking about is transforming field science. And I use the term field science and not ecology because the range of scientific disciplines, the scientists working in different scientific disciplines is huge. So it's not just ecologists, but it's hydrologists, it's geneticists, really anybody who can reasonably advance their research agenda outside now works at RMBL. And so this idea of developing a model ecosystem is to use the Gunnison Basin to better understand ecosystems around the world, to ask very sophisticated, complex questions, um, because we can't study every organism everywhere. This approach of a model ecosystem is a highly effective, highly efficient way to develop, to develop general insights about how the world works. And what we're doing is we're transforming field science by figuring out how to enable this kind of synthetic research and accelerate discovery and exploration in the natural world. And I'm gonna just close with a few final words um, from yet another Rumble scientist, Dr. Michael Soleil. Uh, Michael was another graduate student of Dr. Paul Ehrlich's, and Michael is sort of responsible for founding the discipline of conservation biology, got the journal going, um, was the father of conservation biology, and then he, he sort of uh, became the grandfather of conservation biology. His son, Aaron, worked in the Rumble Dining Hall, and Aaron, I remember him introducing himself as the, the brother of conservation biology. Um, but one of the things that Michael talked a lot about is to not lose track of the inherent value of the world. And so Gretchen Daly has done some wonderful work on ecosystem services and putting economic valuation. But Michael would argue forcefully and eloquently about the fundamental ethics of preserving this beautiful world that we've inherited and passing this world on and that there is a strong ethical prerogative to maintaining that diversity that exists independent of economic value to humans. And he would also point out that we protect what we love. And maybe one of the greatest things that Rumble has to offer is it's a beautiful place and wonderful community that has brought many people to love the outdoors um, and inspire their research and to help generate science that touches people all across the world. Um, and so this idea
of the ecology of place and using the Gunnison Basin as a lens to explore the world, it's not just a scientific tool, but for almost all of these scientists, it's a labor of love and it's something that they've committed to over generations. Um, and so to not acknowledge the love that they bring to their research and the passion, um, it's what uh, really enables that great research, that long-term research. Um, so I just wanted to end with a few words on, uh, from Michael. And to close, I'll just thank you for taking this journey of a little bit over an hour to explore the history of science and Rumble's role within that. Um, it's all about exploration and discovery. Um, the term science did not really come into use until the 1800s. Before that, um, scientists called themselves natural philosophers and science has not been the exclusive domain of experts, but rather it's um, the domain of people that are passionate and have a love of observing the world and understanding it, that love to solve puzzles and problems. Um, so whether you're a scientist or a student or a budding scientist or someone who wishes that they were a scientist, RMBL is for you and we hope that you'll join us and you'll be able to participate in more of our programs for remotely curious about science. Thank you.